We always viewed Riot as a mission-driven company. It's not about us, it's about our players, and we aspire to serve them. Player-focused as maybe the unifying religion or theme that binds the company together. Something that is fun, you know, really isn't sufficient, essentially, because there can be lots of games that are fun, but novelty in terms of experience, how you're going to be adding value to a genre, you know, matters a great deal. You kind of have to, like, consistently triage and ruthlessly prioritize what's important and kind of keep at it but also not lose track of why you're doing this to begin with. That desire for people to identify things that they wanted was incredibly important, but that would then need to be compared to how all of the resources were currently allocated. What is League at 20 years going to look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very special episode uh, for you here today. Uh, somebody who's built something that almost needs no introduction. Uh, we have Mark Merrill on the show. And I want to make sure I get his accomplishments and his work right. So I'm going to do a bit of reading out. Mark is the co-founder, co-chairman, president of games for Riot Games. If you have not been on the internet for the last 15 years, uh, Riot uh, you know, has really changed the world of uh, gaming, created esports, and really also entertainment uh, through, uh, through League of Legends, uh, and then multiple other games uh, since then. Uh, Mark co-founder Riot, and you know, and since then, you know, in not just in the world of gaming, but just broadly entrepreneurship, and then more recently in the world of entertainment through being an executive producer and being one of the creative forces behind Arcane, amazing show. Uh, Mark is just one of you know one of the most interesting people that I've met, uh, and you know, trust me, he's not just a founder; he's ridiculously interesting and fascinating, and this is going to be a delight. Uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, a lot, lot to live up to now after that, that kind of introduction. Thank you. Yeah, no pressure. But well, we're going to start you off easy. Teach us how to build a great game. <laughs> oh, just that softball, huh? Games are difficult things to make. Um, you know, and I, I, we could sort of approach that topic from a lot of perspectives. But, you know, I, I think there's actually a fair amount of similarity to creating a great game uh, as to creating a great company. Because from our perspective, the... I think the, the most important step is first knowing who the audience is that you're going to be trying to serve. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of different ways to, to approach that. But, you know, in our experience, a lot of times there's sort of this like intuitive bottoms up, this deep understanding that a creator or sort of group of creators has around some need or some frustration around other types of games that they've played that they wish could be better in some meaningful ways. And, um, you know, so I can sort of approach it from a lot of different perspectives, but uh, I would say that the, the most important thing is to really understand, you know, who the audience is. Uh, and, you know, from there, you know, game development is really, it's really a team sport for lack of a better term. So, um, you know, it, it takes an awful lot of incredible people to come together that have diverse expertise uh, that sort of share the same dream about like what the needs are for, um, you know, for this audience. And, you know, one of the frameworks that we utilize internally as well, you know, once we have sort of an idea of a particular audience that is sort of underserved in some way, um, you know, we then try to think about, you know, in the other games that have existed that are largely setting the expectations for players, you know, at, at a given point in time, it's you know, what are we going to do to not only sort of meet those player expectations, but of course really exceed them. And so a lot of times, you know, people may think, uh, you know, we want to create a first person shooter and, you know, maybe we could, you know, set it in some theme like the civil war or you sort of skin the game in a particular way, but the gameplay may not, you know, be meaningfully differentiated from other things that exist. And that can be sort of a, a fine, you know, approach for, for many game devs, but typically those types of things aren't sufficiently differentiated to really break out or sort of add something incredibly meaningful to a given genre. And so a lot of times though, in genres that have really high play ex player expectations, because there's been lots of games that have been created, you know, the, the table stakes you know, are incredibly high just to create something that will sort of basically meet player expectations. But then from there, it's like, what again are the sort of meaningful differentiators in terms of why this game needs to exist? Uh, so something that is fun, you know, really isn't sufficient essentially because there can be lots of games that are fun, 
but novelty in terms of experience and sort of how you're going to be adding value to a genre, you know, matters a great deal. So, um, and then for there, you know, it's, it's really all about assembling a passionate team of incredible individuals that have the right skill sets to come together to, again, share that sort of vision and then fail forward uh, for lack of a better term until you start finding the fun and sort of validating as to whether or not that initial vision and thesis about where the opportunity is, is correct. And then sort of building and scaling from there. It really, really helps to understand and look at the world also from starting with that audience perspective and understanding player motivations. Like why do people play these games? Why do people get frustrated in these games? And, you know, of course, adding on the sort of creative thought of wouldn't it be cool if, and uh, just sort of dreaming together with a, a you know, a, ta- a team of talented individuals. Mm-hmm. One of the really interesting things about game development to me, and I think movie making is and content creation is similar, is it's so interdisciplinary, right? Uh, you have uh, storytelling, you have you know graphical uh, you know artists and the art side. There's obviously pushing the technical boundaries of what is possible uh, on computers and networks. Then there's a whole element of uh, you know the gameplay mechanics, uh, and of course in your world, so much of it is competitive, and you know there's kind of the that dynamic also. This seems to be very different skill sets, very different kind of human beings who write code, you know, or create artifacts in, uh, you know, Maya or Blender or whatever. What have you learned about getting very disparate skill sets and personalities to work together? Because I think that's one of the things that you guys have done really well. You can really create the category in so many ways in, say, competitive esports and so on. What have you learned? Yeah, I've learned a lot. And, and part of the reason I think we've learned a lot is because we've made a ton of mistakes, <laughs> um, and so, you know, a couple of things, but to your point is that games are incredibly cross disciplinary. And I think that there's some really important things around ensuring that the strategy of the organization and the game is incredibly crisp. Sometimes it takes some time for that, again, specific vision to really crystallize. And then, you know, we need to define sort of the structure of how you're going to work and the systems that are going to come together and the people that are going to be involved. And all of that needs to work together and be you know sort of synergistic and, and sort of pointing at the same problem in our experience there's a, there's a couple of things that are that have been really helpful so one is also we've always valued the attitude and aptitude and sort of genre expertise and sort of deep passion and understanding for the space over experience mm-hmm. and the reason that we think that that's been helpful is because we think it's much harder to train people to love a particular game and sort of understand the ultra subtle nuances for why a particular audience would or would not appreciate some particular feature or piece of content compared to teaching people craft or teaching people, you know, or augmenting those types of people who are focused on solving the what, you know, with competency. And so part of how we built our organization and evolved over time is, you know, given the complexity, you know, it's it's a death sentence to try to run a fun, functionally managed organization. So we think matrixes are incredibly important because it just is, reflects the reality of the complexity of the problems you're trying to solve. And then you need to, you know, have, again, sort of the right artists and the right designer and engineer or, and engineers, you know, um, and product people. Uh, and QA folk, you know, all working together for very clear deliverables. You know, in our experience, functionally managed organizations tend to struggle greatly because of the interdependencies. And so a lot of the agile philosophies from a development standpoint, we think are incredibly important mm-hmm. to utilizing game development because so much of the work is discovery where there are unknown unknowns. You know, it's important to spike and or test particular concepts to then learn, is this direction sort of the right direction in terms of how, whether the feature will work or how to implement a particular feature or um, or not, you know? And so the rate of iteration is also something that is incredibly important. Uh, but we think that that's of course true, not just for games, but for, you know, creative development in general uh, and companies in general. But, you know, oftentimes in game development, of course, you don't have the luxury um, unless a game is shipped and then live and you're sort of iterating on a game that's live to you know, iterate in a live audience. And so having a team that, again, is incredibly aligned 
around what the opportunity is and what the vision is and can quickly validate as to whether or not you're making progress mm -hmm. towards something that's going to work or not is, a, is another sort of measure of team effectiveness. There's sort of a lot of abstract concepts in there. Hopefully that makes sense, yeah. you know, but um, for us, you know, it's really about people and teams and aligning on goals. And, um, you know, the way that that scales is, of course, really difficult also, uh, because I think a lot of teams, when they're smaller, sort of intuitively operate that way. Mm -hmm. But then when you start to get into 50 person team, 100 person team, 300, you know, 500 person teams and or different parts of the organization, getting them all to continue to play nicely and be super aligned about the problems to solve with players and or shipping internationally in different languages and all those things is another, uh, you know, really complex topic we can get into to the extent that that's interesting. Yeah. I, one thing which I think really interests me is you might have seen the famous Steve Jobs slide, Apple is at the intersection of technology and art. And I think games are very similar because there is definitely a huge engineering quantitative element to it, uh, you yep. know, which kind of built with hard facts and engineering. But there is then there's so much taste, right? The feel of a gun, you know, uh, yep. the feel of, you know, the feel of the game. And so much of it is in the realm of taste and aesthetic and feel. Mm -hmm. How do you marry the constraints? Because in one, is when I look at that slide from Steve Jobs, I'm like, great. One of this is easy to measure. I can measure technology. I know how to make a packet go faster. I know how to measure the metrics. Um, but then there is the feel, right? The feel of how hard should something be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it's not too easy to hard up. How do you marry these two things, which sometimes seem in very different dimensions and hard to reconcile? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're really cutting to the heart of one of the things that makes game development difficult. Um, but it's also one of the things that makes game developers such cool and interesting people, you know, because, uh, you know, to your point, they're sort of so they're both left brain and right brain in terms of incredibly technical, but also incredibly creative. And again, like for but for exactly what you're saying around taste, that's why we think it's so important for people to share the same dream and have the same vision and mm -hmm. often like the same things in the same type of experience because when when different individuals when their taste is off even if their craft expertise again from an art or engineering or design perspective is sort of off the charts the weighting of when something is good enough or how to prioritize it or adjust the particular sound effect or visual effect or animation speed or the frame rate of a particular you know again animation or whatnot is it, just there is there is a lot of art that is involved in that, which relates to sort of intuitive judgment. But that's also where iteration can be incredibly helpful. And that's also where the team dynamic is so important also. And so while it's it's helpful and actually critical to have a strong vision, in our experience, games are really made great by the thousands and thousands of micro decisions that are happening on a daily basis. And that can only be possible when all the developers, again, are sort of aligned and deeply understand what they're making mm -hmm. and what good looks like. And the definition of good is just as important to define as sort of like the definition of done. You know, And there's different dimensions you can evaluate that through. You can look at it through a feature lens. You can look at it through a craft lens. You can look at it through a how does it, of course, show up on screen for players and manifest for field perspective. So, you know, is this texture good, you know, or done, or does this section of a map, right? You know, when are you done, right? You can obviously polish a bush or sort of, you know, rocks or any type of part of a level, you know, infinitely. Mm -hmm. Building, like having taste and identifying when is something good enough, and then building frameworks to help convey that information to help inform other people's development from sort of a production standpoint is one of the reasons that, you know, production is also such an important development craft to align and help manage the work of so many talented, expensive you know, individuals, um, you know, where opportunity cost is often one of the most uh, you know, expensive yeah. aspects of game development. Because we can kind of create anything. And what you go to focus on you know, uh, is really important. And, and one of the things I think is a trap oftentimes for you know, a lot of developers is feeling like they're making a ton of progress and they are, but they're just making progress, of course, in something that doesn't really matter or in the wrong direction or there's a major diminishing returns. And so how to know when you're hitting that point does come down often to judgment that needs to be 
sort of a detailed understanding of that particular thing you're making, but also how that feature or system or piece of content is connected to all the others. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew a really effective way to help develop that skill set because it, in my in our experience, it, it takes time. And again, absent a deep understanding of a vision and sort of what would be great for players, it, you know, you can sort of never close that gap. You know, so um, I think one of the things that's really been helpful for Riot over the many years is, you know, not just having sort of data to help inform decisions, mm -hmm. but sort of knowing when to utilize that data or various technical frameworks to sort of validate our approach, but having the courage among the team to take big, bold risks mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and leverage sort of the art perspective based on that sort of intuitive, nonlinear belief about sort of the wouldn't it be cool if for that audience that we're trying to make something great for. I think it's very interesting on uh, successful teams and what they do well. To me, there's a lot of parallels to starting founding companies like startups. Um, because again, very similarly, if you are a founder, you have all these things that you want to go do. You know, you're early, you're resource constrained, lots of different problem spaces for you to go tackle on. And it's really easy to kind of pick a space that you're comfortable in or you think needs that level of detail and polish and go really deep there. But that might not be the thing that customers want or is going to bring in revenue or, you know, whatever, pick a dimension that's going to be successful for you. You kind of have to like consistently triage and ruthlessly prioritize what's important and kind of keep at it but also not lose track of why you're doing this to begin with. Like there is this, you know, you're doing this in service of something else. You're doing this for, you know, helping somebody else. And that, that, that longer form like storytelling and like having that vision in your head and you can't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. So to me, there are a lot of parallels between game design development, building something and founding a startup, I think. I completely agree with you. I think that's very well said. You know, and I think that there are some processes or systems you can also build to help try to foster that thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, early on, one of the the sort of meetings that was pretty frustrating for, you know, our team that, you know, I think in hindsight ended up being pretty important was when we were, you know, before the launch of League of Legends, uh, you know, and we launched it in 2009, but, you know, we were spending a fixed amount of other people's money. And at one point, you know, we had the highest burn rate of any company in our VC portfolio. And, you know, this is our first time building a company, building a game. We have no idea what we're doing. We're sort of the mighty ducks. You know, you know a lot of a lot of desire and heart, but, you know, not a lot of skill or capability. Um, and, you know, but as we started to really level up the team with some great experts that had a lot of experience and whatnot, relative to many of the companies that they had come from, right, our capabilities or tools or, you know, our systems or whatnot were just really much less mature, which would be frustrating. And so that would then create a desire among lots of individuals to complain and or advocate for different features or you know, tool improvements or different things to sort of help make their respective lives easier. You know, of course, artists would be advocating for better tools for lighting or animation or, you know, whatever it is, designers from a content creation perspective or abilities and, you know, engineers would want a million different things. And um what, like we actually think that that desire for people to identify things that they wanted was incredibly important, but that would then need to be compared to how all of the resources were currently allocated. Mm -hmm. And so we would have this meeting every two weeks where we'd hear from everybody, what would, what would you want to advocate for from your perspective? And then we'd compare, here's how all the team resources are allocated. Do we hear anything that everybody's saying that is more important that we're currently working on? You know, and generally the answer would be no. And so then the perspective would be like, okay, great. So when we walk out the door, then like, let's be a team and be quite aligned that this is what we're doing. And so, because again, we found early on, you know, our team was uh, was quite frustrated, you know, given the sort of lack of capabilities and all these, but driving alignment around what we're doing and why and being able to evangelize was also really, really important. And then just figuring out how to get creative with all these constraints to still accomplish what we needed to get on screen while simultaneously in the long run sort of working on longer term or optimal solutions. And, you know, to your point about being resource constrained, we still feel resource constrained to this day, you know, with thousands of people around the world now, um, because 
you know, and one of the things that's really important, of course, is to sort of balance and throttle the work in progress mm. and, you know, the scope and ambition. And you're always going to be resource constrained if there's opportunity. And yeah. so in a lot of ways, it's sort of a, it's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, and we have a throughput problem, generally not a, you know, an opportunity problem, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, I think a place you want to be. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so I want to go down memory lane and get the Mark Metal origin story, uh, because I think there are multiple pieces to it. Uh, but maybe the first piece that I really want to get to uh, is, you know, as somebody who's been, you know, behind one of the most successful games of all time, it's very interesting to kind of hear what were your formative gaming influences. For example, when I think about me, like a lot of other people my age group, I grew up on Super Mario, then Contra, then graduated to Quake 3 and Half uh, and Half Life and Counter Strike and that like, the kind of the evolution for anybody sort of born in the 80s, I suspect. What yep. were your formative gaming experiences influences? You know, I've loved games my whole life. Um, and, you know, a, a quick funny story is, uh, you know, my parents didn't want me to have a Nintendo when it was sort of all the rage, uh, but I ended up winning one in a school raffle uh, my, <laughs> when I was a you know, first grader. And uh, with only like a, a handful of tickets, it was the grand prize. Mm-hmm. And so then my parents didn't have the heart to take it away from me. And so, um, you know, started actually with an Atari that we happened to have at home then, but then, you know, got Nintendo and, you know, loved, you know, Tech Mobile and Contra mm-hmm. and, you know, Ghosts and Goblins and, you know, oh, yeah. uh, Atari Wars and so many different games that we talked about back then. Then moved on to Genesis, but, you know, right around sort of the end of the Nintendo era you know, and the beginning of the Genesis from a console standpoint, we got our first PC at home. Mm-hmm. And that to me was transformational where I sort of fell in love with the PC, you know, messing around with, you know, MS DOS, you know, 3.0 and adjusting batch files to try to get games to work, you know, changing oh, you know, yeah. conventional memory, you know, boot disks and all that stuff. And uh, the first games that I really started to love on PC were, uh, you know, Heroes Quest. Uh, so you want to be a hero from uh, Sierra. And, uh, you know, they also made Police Quest and State Quest and a bunch of great games like that. But so those adventure games are great. I then loved, you know, as the, as the modem, you know, started to come out and BBS had started to emerge. I started playing, um, you know, some essentially like text-based MUDs on some BBSs. Um, and that was phenomenal. Like, I just was always interested in online games. I played Dungeons & Dragons growing up. My older brother, Rick, uh, you know, came home one day with his friend Alan and sort of, you know, brought some D&D books and we dove in. I thought that was amazing. Ended up playing uh, some Warhammer 40K, also, which is a tabletop war game. And um, and so, you know, loved tabletop, loved, you know, console games, loved online games. But <clears throat> it was really online games and then ultimately sort of MMOs uh, that really sort of captured my heart. Um, I played a ton of, uh, you know, Blizzard is probably my favorite developer growing up. You know, I loved Warcraft 2 and, and Starcraft. And then, of course, Warcraft 3 played the heck out of World of Warcraft. Um, but from an MMO perspective, uh, you know, also loved EverQuest and Ultima Online. So mm-hmm. just incredible experiences there. Um, but to your point, also loved competitive games. And so, uh, you know, played Counter-Strike and, uh, you know, Rainbow Six, you know, mm-hmm. in the early days. And on Cali, you know, in different leagues and things like that. And so uh, Brandon and I, you know, we all, the first business plan that we started working on when we were, uh, you know, at USC together in the University of Southern California was um, to start an esports company where we wanted to build third party events mm-hmm. for uh, for certain games that we love to help foster competition. And uh, we ended up not doing anything with that, with that business plan, but, you know, it's been, of course, pretty exciting to, uh, you know, be able to, contributed to the esports scene, you know, mm-hmm. League of Legends and what we've done, uh, you know, there in Valorant. <clears throat> but, um, you know, for me, it's just I, like, I think going deep in few games rather than, you know, playing sort of every game that comes out was, was really the, the way that sort of my gaming taste evolved um, and largely around PC, you know, even though I've also, of course, played a lot of console games and lots mm-hmm. of other things as well. It's interesting because I think given that your early access to the internet, um, in some ways, uh, I think League really, uh, you know, invented like competitive online esports. So I, I suspect there is a connective tissue there between your online experiences with the early MUDs and, for example, in other world where you didn't have internet access and you're playing only, you know, on your PC locally, uh, it may not have led to the world where you create, you understand social dynamics, you understand community and all the things that happen later, which maybe, you know, which brings us something else that I really want to ask you about. It seems like 
there is a formative moment where you finish school, right? And, you know, and at the time, there is really not a lot of career options in working in gaming, I would suspect, at least not the way it exists today. And you had kind of a fork in the road. I would love for you to maybe paint the picture of where you were in your life, what was going on in your head, and what made you choose. Because a lot of our audience are in that age group, thinking about their life path, their career path, and, you know, and I think that's such an interesting story. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I feel like I got incredibly lucky um, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, my, um, you know, I went to SC and I studied political science and psychology and I had no idea what I wanted to study. I always figured I'd go get my MBA or maybe I'd go to law school. And I just had so many different interests, uh, you know, that I was undecided for two years. And so I started, you know, getting internships and, and working a couple different jobs. And, you know, I worked at Merrill Lynch my senior year, called in the wealth management team. And, but this is right when the sort of internet bubble started bursting, right, you know, towards, you know, 2001. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was hoping to get hired, you know, by this wealth management team as like a junior analyst. And, uh, but they wanted a hiring freeze. And so, you know, I was working there for 30 hours a week, um, you know, my senior year while taking more than a full load, you know, getting in the office or waking up at like four in the morning, you know, sometimes my roommates would still be up. And did you like it at all? Was it any fun at all? Or were you like, I don't want to do this. What am I doing with my life? The thing that I liked about it was I, I thought the people were smart and driven and I, I wanted to be around other people that, you know, had drive that I really felt like could make me better and that I could learn from. Because um, one of the things I learned in college is, you know, I, I sort of am like Newtonian physics where, you know, when I'm at rest, I will stay at rest, you know, or when I'm in motion, I will stay in motion. Like if I have a hundred things to do, I'll sort of do them all and I'll do them well. And I get really stimulated and engaged, whereas otherwise I'll sort of procrastinate, I'll play a bunch of games, things like that. And so I really had to, I needed to put myself into a very challenging, dynamic, stimulating environment to really help rise to my potential. Um, and so, but after, you know, after uh, not being able to be hired at Merrill Lynch, I then tried to figure out what to do. I still wanted to work in finance as my first part of my career, just to sort of check the box on the quant skill set and uh, ended up working as a you know commercial lending analyst uh, mm-hmm. at U.S. Bank. And that was really not for me. Um, really, really didn't like the job um, because it was incredibly one dimensional. And. You know, I could go through all sorts of stories about that, but also the the people environment there were not nearly as engaged, say, compared to you know the team that I was with at Merrill Lynch, and so that led to a bit of an existential crisis for me. Where I'm like, wow, what am I going to do with my life? I don't know. I feel like maybe I should go join the military, or you know, I really was you know reflecting deeply about how to go get into an environment that would really challenge myself. I ended up working at a company and trying to shift gears. Um, to then go, I joined the the corporate marketing department for a company called Advanced Star Communications, which operated trade shows and published business to business magazines, and sort of lucked out where I ended up being able to work relatively closely with their CEO, uh, this guy named Joe Loja, who sort of liked me also because I could write decently well and write like his memos or board decks or things like that, um, but then also could, you know, given some of my banking experience, you know, could help managing the numbers and put together metric sheets and, and things like that. And um, learned a lot from him about how I ran the company. Stayed there for about two and a half years. Uh, and then while doing that, that's when Brandon and I, you know, were uh, living together in our apartment in West Hollywood and started working on the, the business plan for Riot. And that was totally driven by just passion, you know, as players were, you know, we were playing a lot of a mod of Warcraft 3 at the time called Dota, mm-hmm. uh, of course, which we absolutely loved. And from our perspective, it helped to demonstrate what we thought was going to be the future of the game business. And that, you know, here was this mod that was growing virally that, you know, community members were updating uh, that was still sort of shoehorned inside a map editor of Warcraft 3. But the community loved it and were incredibly engaged and evangelizing the game. And uh, it would sort of evolve and grow with all these different modders that were contributing to it over time. And. And, uh, you know, we thought that games as a service was really going to become the way that the game would evolve or that the industry would evolve. And, you know, we were playing other MMOs at the time. And a lot of times we'd hop on the forums and, you know, write a big message board post where we'd try to get feedback to the developers. And, you know, they'd say working as intended or sort of wouldn't respond at all. And Mm -hmm. we, you know, sort of dreamt of building a company that would put players at the center of decision making rather than, you know, how a lot of content was created at the time, which was sort of made for a shiny disc to be sold, you know, at retail. And, uh, you know, League of Legends was going to be sort of the proof point to this broader company, their thesis around high quality, you know, incredible yeah. games 
as a service to a hardcore audience. Um, you know, but also, of course, where our business model as a free to play game was going to be to be selling digital goods. Uh, and that was a very difficult thing to raise money for because, you know, in, in 2006, you know, that was, uh, you know, pre-cloud computing and, you know, uh, pre-iPhone. And so it was a very different world at the time that worked out. You know, that is sort of the intellectual business side, which we're going to get into. But I think the emotional life side is so fascinating because I know so many people who are on the default career life path. Um, and there are some really smart people. Like, for example, there is a there is an alternate dimension where Mark Merrill climbs up the you know sort of the finance wealth manager chart, makes partner, uh, is extremely well compensated uh, by the age you're forty. But you obviously, you know, you're not changing the world of gaming. I know a lot of people, right? They kind of do the next thing, do the next thing, become a doctor, become a lawyer, become etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and you're just doing the default thing. And then one day you're age thirty five, age forty, and not that it's too late, but you have the sudden crisis of like, okay, well. Well, I should have done something then. And sometimes it's actually harder to take a risk then than when you're 22 and living with another guy uh, as a roommate. And then we have like a family and kids and whatnot. And it, do you see that? Because I think that's such, such an interesting decision to make. And because you have a good role and you give that up to make a plunge. For sure. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is I felt incredibly excited about the opportunity to take a risk because to, to exactly to your point around one, like I think the naivete in terms of how hard it would be and how unqualified, you know, Brandon and I actually were to pull off what we were trying to do was helpful uh, because, uh, you know, we sort of joke, but I think it's true that like if we knew what we knew now in terms of all the different things that would have had to come together to be able to pull off uh, you know, what, what occurred, you know, it probably wouldn't have died. And so, um, so I think that naive optimism was incredibly helpful as well as the time in our lives where we were, you know, we didn't have families and, uh, you know, all this, the associated responsibilities of, um, you know, needing to support, you know, lifestyle and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, both Brandon and I are married, you know, now for, for many, many years, uh, you know, he's got four kids. I have two kids, you know, that are, that are eight and nine. And, um, it's a real difficult challenge to dedicate yourself now you know, for at least for me to dedicate myself the way that I did, you know, when I was in my 20s and early 30s, you know, I, I mean, I want to spend a ton of time with my kids. I think it's absolutely critical. Like, this, we're not going to get this time back. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I feel incredibly fortunate and grateful that, you know, I'm in a, a situation or opportunity where, you know, I can still do what I love to do on, on the game side, but, uh, you know, can still lean in on the family side. And, you know, my wife's an entrepreneur as well, you know, Ashley, you know, but, but building companies while raising kids, uh, you know, is, is an incredibly challenging thing. And so to your point around, uh, you know, sort of the emotional management piece, you know, I do think that, you know, as I reflect on the journey, managing my own psychology was the hardest part of the entire experience uh, because there's so many moments where we felt like we we're going to fail, so many moments where we almost did fail, mm -hmm. so many moments that felt like we were going to let down the entire team, company, our players, and those experiences over time, I think, have sort of helped me calibrate and have sort of a healthier way to engage and sort of, you know, operate in a long term perspective. But it's really been a journey. The story of kind of the, you know, the the initial several years of League and Riot has been told in multiple forms. And, you know, I was trying to figure out, like, how to kind of like best tackle it here. And I think one sort of interesting axis is Riot being such a player focused company. And, you know, in a lot of companies, I think that kind of sentence can sound like a platitude. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's a, th it's a thing that you hear on employee orientation, but then nobody really cares about. But as you kind of dig into this and talk to people, it's kind of so impressed by things little and big that you folks do uh, to really embody the face. For example, the fact that somebody can call up uh, customer support, and I believe they shot a few uh, RP and they paint in MS Paint, right? You make, it's, it's a tiny little goofy things to some really big things. So I'm kind of curious about, you know, the initial years of Riot and League, and but really tied to the idea of like being so player focused as maybe the unifying religion or theme that binds the company together? Yeah, it really is. You know, we always viewed Riot as a mission driven company mm -hmm. uh, to your earlier point where it's not about us, it's about our players and we aspire to serve them. Um, and that orientation and having it actually manifest mm -hmm. in terms of how we're making decisions, what we're willing to prioritize, what we're going to do or not do you know, as a company was, I think, one of the most important elements to attracting great talent that wanted to really support that mission and, and pour their heart and souls into you know, building league. 
Um, you know, league is at so many different teams as an example over time. You know, and you know, Riot's now about forty hundred people around the world. That mission and orientation and sort of cultural aspect of people that are willing to go above and beyond and recognize that the difference between a great decision in our business and a terrible decision is how that decision manifests for our players is the thing which has led to all of our innovation, whether it's business model or why we ended up publishing ourselves or how we expanded internationally or why we built esports the way we did or why we've invested in music and then something we did, you know, TV with Arcane. It's everything has dri been driven from that perspective of how do we make it better to be a player? And it's amazing when you have a like-minded group of people who are challenging each other to try to go do uh, incredible things for a, for a different audience. And I think that's the most important yeah. thing we got right at yeah. the company. All the success of Riot has been driven by you know the incredible people who do the great work every you know day in and day out. Okay, I want to ask you something, which is you know, do you have an example of a story or a decision where other companies would have gone Ooh. in a different direction, but being player focused meant that you may have had a difficult decision or handled a difficult situation? Do you have an example of that? Lots. Well, in, in one of the just the biggest things that is a, a challenge around being player focused is is actually the way that we make decisions, I think, in an ideal situation is oftentimes counter to the short term best interests of the company mm -hmm. from like a PL perspective. So we look at revenue as a trailing indicator where if we're doing the thing the right thing upstream where players are engaged and they're playing and they're loving the game and they're feeling like we're adding a great amount of value, then it's, you know, we're aligning our perspective with that of our players where it's, if they're not buying our skins or not playing our game, it's like, well, what else can we do to like do a better job? They can make something that else that they may want to, you know, appreciate. And that means that operating a scale of business from sort of a traditional general management perspective actually clashes with those goals. And mm. so, there's many situations where, you know, there may be some type of sponsor that is willing to pay a lot more money to do it, say, a brand sponsorship deal on the esports side or whatnot, but that that brand may not resonate sufficiently with their players or the nature of the deal in some way would feel a little bit more like it's extracting value rather than adding value or whatnot. And it's like all of our biggest mistakes as an organization have come from those types of situations where we're actually not putting players at the center of our decisions for whatever reason. And it's not because there's evil people that are twisting their mustache. <laughs> it, it's, it's really well-intentioned, smart people that you know, or different systems or incentives that we have maybe unintentionally designed in the organization let's say like a B2B revenue target, you know, that are causing great people to work on that goal, but in a way that they're not fully connecting the dots down the chain in terms of how that's going to then manifest your players. And that is something we really struggle with. And at scale, we've, you know, I think a lot of our biggest mistakes sort of come from that type of execution. And so we we're constantly working on doing a better job of clarifying you know, how to actually add that, what that looks like. And we have to do a lot of training and education uh, and sort of reverse mentorship where, you know, we're people who are much closer to what's happening on the ground in a given game, you know, can work with and educate other parts of the organization uh, around where things are at with players. And, and it's just managing that balance is, this is really, really difficult, mm -hmm. um, which has been an impediment on our growth uh, as well. But I think in a, in to a certain extent, a healthy way, because there's the, the, the amount of talent that exists that can manage a really complex global organization, but simultaneously understands how a decision is going to manifest for our players and what will be great or not. is just a really narrow pool. Hmm. And so um, anyway, so that's a tension that exists constantly. And, um, you know, uh, like one example, actually, as it relates to Arcane, and th this is. This is sort of an interesting situation, but Arcane was giving, given a particular budget uh, to go build an animation pipeline and, and to go you know, build uh, several seasons. And one of the things that happened over time, and I'm gonna, this is going to make a very long story sort of short, we were behind schedule and over budget for season one based on the sort of rough back of the envelope math in terms of what it should take to build the season. 
So naturally, right, there became the desire to catch up and to spend less. You know, one of the ways or techniques to do that would be, well, let's go outsource, right? Let's go find another studio in Hyderabad, right? Or, you know, in India or, you know, a, a great studio in China or whatnot. And let's train them on the animation pipeline and, and you know, try to build more assets for less. But, but the challenge is the unique style yeah. and animation pipeline and taste and creative dynamic that was able to make Arcane was so unique and is so beautiful and has so much chemistry mm -hmm. and so much artistry in every frame that it would have been impossible to go train or arguably impossible another studio, especially in a reasonable amount of time and to level up their talent and get enough alignment. And so the actual act of trying to save money would actually try to probably end up destroying the project. Oh, yeah. and, at, and at one point, the creator of, uh, of Arcane Christian resigned. Uh, with, because of some of that tension where, you know, there was sort of misalignment, um, you know, between you know, some of the, some of the leaders because, you know, Christian was so oriented towards, I have to create this amazing thing. I think it's great and didn't feel like it was being valued or sort of properly understood. And, you know, we we're able to sort of go help resolve that situation as you know, a company, but it just, it illustrates the danger and challenge of sort of a traditional management system on something that is so creative and requires so much faith uh, and taste and ties to that vision because we were taking a massive risk. I mean, even Netflix called Arcane when they first saw it, you know, and they were a great partner and, and did awesome things, but a feathered fish where they're like, it's adult animation, you know, like, but in a, in sort of this like hardcore style, like that doesn't exist. There's like, there's anime and there's mm -hmm. Pixar, mm -hmm. but like nobody watches this. Like, you know, where's the market? Just because mm -hmm. somebody hasn't done something doesn't mean it can't work or be great. You know, and, but having the courage without the data points to go persevere through something that is also very expensive relative to what else has been done can be terrifying. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's very important for leaders organizationally to try to foster a psychologically safe environment, um, you know, where you can allow for experimentation and failure uh, and things like that. And that's just really hard to do at scale. Yeah. Now, I'm so happy it brought up Arcane because, this, you know, on my notes, I was like, I want to, I want to spend so much time talking about this. Um, now, I'm going to do a little speech here. I, I think it's safe to say that the history of video game IP turned into scripted content is not good, right? Like, you know, uh, it's 100 years from now when there's retrospective on the golden age of cinema, the Doom movie is not going to be in there. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, sorry, folks who worked on the Doom movie. Um, and, you know, so when Arcane came out, right, there were so many things that was going against it on paper. Number one, video game IP turned into scripted content. You're working with this slightly out of the way Parisian studio for which I really want you to kind of talk about, which is I think you're referring to. Uh, and you're also doing it purely in house, and by a set of people who have like really no background in creating scripted content. So there's so many. And I remember Arthur and I watching this, and to be honest, you know, I you know, I play League, but I'm not like a huge player, so I was not like coming in with a lot of fandom. And we went like, and holy shit, like we were blown away right like first episode we actually binging this last night to prepare for they were like and we were like this is so good like you know this animation style the emotional style is just i think the storytelling um the visuals of it incredibly powerful very consistent you know from episode to episode um you feel for the characters you know exactly what they're feeling and going through this is um a well-told story that is also really masterfully created from like a graphical standpoint from like visual effects standpoint it's like it's it's just yeah. it's it's such a textbook way of like taking an, an existing ip and doing a fantastic job all around even for people who have no idea what league is they would come in and i'm guessing that's like a lot of people who are watching arcane for the first time where they're like i don't know what this like the league thing is but i just want to like watch the show kind mm -hmm. of thing and they come in and they look at it and say, wow, I'm like so invested in the story. And I was looking at like the hashtags on Twitter and stuff. A lot of these people don't know League, right? And yeah. they're just like going with it. And there's just huge fandom around it. 
Um, yeah, and, and, and even if you know League, League, you know, MOBAs are really hard to tell, do storytelling in. Yeah. Like, that's not what yeah. they, you know, they, you know, it's not like, for example, like, you know, Last of Us seems to be having a great show, right? Like, there's so much storytelling. And so anyway, so the reason is just to say, we are huge fans, right? Yeah. Love it, you know, and if you have, if folks are watching this, if you haven't seen it, watch RK, and then there's amazing content on YouTube about the making of RK, and highly recommend it. But I would love for you to maybe unpack some of the origin story behind some of these decisions, because in, again, alternate universe, you could have gone to a traditional Hollywood movie maker creator, not done it in house. You can go to a tradition studio and you took so many unconventional decisions and allowed to maybe tell us the story behind that. Thanks for the uh the sort of the praise. You know, um we're incredibly proud of it, right? Incredibly proud of the team that's that's behind it. And also incredibly proud of all of the writers who have worked hard on on it you know, really behind the scenes on doing all the world building. You know, because because to your point, you know, League is a multiplayer online battle arena game. And you know, you, you have these champions that are pretty small, you know, on screen that you play for a, a given game session. And but when we were always creating these characters, all of us were dreaming that they were real and they were from real places, even if we hadn't yet done the creative development to, you know, really define what is Demacia, which is a, a section of the world, aside from originally this being a point on a map. Mm-hmm. But as League became more successful and, you know, we started generating revenue and, and profit eventually, like it sort of gave us the excuse or justification to be able to continue to invest mm-hmm. not only in League of Legends, you know, then, of course, in esports and other things like that, other games, but then also to really build out the world, to build a foundation for great storytelling. But, you know, League, the MOBA, to your point, is not a great vehicle for storytelling. Storytelling is really setting for mm-hmm. League of Legends, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's about context and who these characters are. But as you play these characters for, you know, hundreds of hours and thousands of hours and you start to get to know the personalities, the art's really cool. Players want to know more about them. And so the origin was, you know, a lot of the, the individuals are sort of involved in you know, the creation of a lot of these characters. And we're always talking about, you know, what would it what would it be like to build a League movie or um, but it was really, mm-hmm. you know, Brandon, you know, my partner and, you know, and Christian Link and then, you know, Alex E, who really sort of helped kick off Arcane and and make it a thing. And, and so Christian showed up one day, you know, who was also uh, working with Fortiche originally when they were much, much smaller. Uh, do you want to maybe doing... talk about who, who Fortiche is and what they do? Yeah. So Fortiche is, uh, you know, an animation studio located in Paris. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we started working with them back in 2013, where, you know, we took the sort of really crazy step also of launching a character in the legend with a music, you know, a soundtrack and, and then a music video. Um, and that was, you know, that's where we launched Jinx actually uh, with a get Jinx song and with a, with a music video that really sort of uh, was designed to illustrate her personality. And anyway, we did lots of collaborations with Fortiche over the years then, you know, and Christian in particular, who was, you know, at the front lines of driving a lot of cooperation, you know, really felt that they had genius level creative talent and that, you know, wanted to help find ways to unlock it. And, you know, from an art and animation and aesthetic perspective. And so, you know, but doing some cool trailers, which we were doing in, in 2012, 2013, 2014, some music videos, you know, and some high end CG and some fight scenes, going from there to then a full, you know, featured TV series with dialogue and great character development was a massive leap. Mm. And so we we're all incredibly intimidated by it. But the cool thing is, is when you have incredible, incredibly talented people that believe in the mission and want to do great things for players and love these characters, love the IP, you know, the constraints drive a lot of innovation. And so, you know, originally Christian showed up and with some animation tests and was like, hey, like, look at this cool animation style. Like, let, like let's get some budget and let's figure this out. And anyway, um, it just sort of evolved over the years where, you know, we had to help grow Fortiche from, you know, the handful of animators there are to now, you know, over, you know, 300 animators. Uh, there's actually a, a documentary series that, um, that released that, that yeah. talks about it, that, uh, you know, it's called Bridging the Rift. It's, mm-hmm. it's the sort of, you know, behind the scenes, uh, you know, episode around the making of Arcane. You know, it's also like Arcane almost didn't happen multiple times as well, because uh, at one point, you know, Brandon made the tough call as well when the show wasn't good enough, but we had, you know, hundreds of animators working on it to hit pause and sort of and redo, you know, a bunch of the scripts. And, uh, you know, we had to figure out, like, what were we going to do to pivot, you know, these several hundred animators to, to that we don't lose them, you know, to put them on some some interesting projects. 
And uh, you know that actually led to the creation of one of our notable bands, which is KDA, which mm-hmm. is a K-pop band. Uh, we released a, a soundtrack and a song, or a song rather, called Pop Stars, which ended up becoming you know the, the world's most downloaded song in 2018. You know the music video ended up having you know hundreds of millions of views just on YouTube and you know billions of views around the world. And you know so just the like the talent and team and passion in and around Arcane and our, our music mm-hmm. abilities, uh, we're just incredibly fortunate to you know, have incredible people there. Why were you doing this in-house? Because a lot of other companies would have been like, well, we don't have the internal capability to do scripted content. We don't do story. We don't make movies. We make amazing games. Great. We don't make movies. We don't say, let's hand this off. Let's call up somebody in Hollywood who's done this before. Let's hand it over. We can collaborate. Now, you made this kind of unconventional choice to go do it yourselves in-house. Why? Yeah, well, we're located in LA too. So, you know, uh, you know, we obviously know a lot of people at, at the various studios and studios would come by and, and hit us up from time to time. And, but the, the what was interesting was, you know, the studios essentially would be like, hey, we, we'd love to make a lead movie or, mm-hmm. or do something or collaborate. And they're like, OK, well, why? You know, and they'd say, well, because it's big. And, you know, it, it quickly became apparent that the goals oftentimes, especially, you know, dating back 10 plus years ago, you know, was, again, to sort of sell tickets. And, mm-hmm. and our goal was, well, we want to want to make something great and, you know, to really help enhance and invest in the IP. And so we just had, we recognized that there was goal misalignment, but then, you know, what to do about that. Um, and, you know, when we still wanted to try to bring a show to bear or do great storytelling in the universe, essentially meant that we would have to find the right partner, you know, or build capabilities in house. And generally speaking, like that's actually the same dynamic that led to why we ended up doing a lot of esports in house or building music in houses. We sort of realized We'd love to partner whenever we can find partners that can truly align with us and really, really care. And we've had some great successful collaborations, you know, including with like a band like Imagine Dragons, you know, who play League, yeah. and, you know. Yep. Um, but and the title song yeah. for Arcane, among other things. Yes. Right. And so yeah, that's that we originally collaborated with them in, in 2014 to make the song Warriors, uh, and they performed at our world championships in Korea. And then that relationship continued to build over time, which led to the enemy set, you know, track, which is the opening track for Arcane. But that's like an example of great chemistry, great alignment, you know, but that's just rare. And we, mm-hmm. we figured out over time that Riot's pretty hard to partner with. We're hard to partner with because our goals, again, are just often different than many of the companies. And so that meant that, you know, we had to have sort of necessity to be the mother of invention, which is how do we do it ourselves? And then, you know, Christian and Alex, as an example, who were the two showrunners of Arcane, they had never written a page of TV before in their life. Wow. But they are incredible creators, incredible storytellers loved our characters you know and just and figured it out uh you know and augmented like we had a writer's room with some great people in it but it wasn't working and then we had to reboot it and so you know we had to iterate yeah. and it took, that's why it took us six years i, I want to maybe just actually go deep in just what you just said which is um you know will will write of legendary of sim city etc is an amazing master class and you know one thing that i really remember is he said the emotional palette of movies is very different emotional palette for video game in a video game for example yeah. you have emotions like teamwork right winning something which you never get in a movie and mm-hmm. sometimes movies are very good at delivering things like suspense or tragedy or romance or turning someone on which is sometimes harder in a game, but maybe not you know we have great storytelling but they're different what do you now know about creating a compelling story and how it is crafted that you didn't know when you started this so the way christian would describe it right was you know, he would argue that the inexperience was helpful because when he, you know, when they originally sat down and started to write a script for a pilot and then outline for the season, they were doing it in a way that was very unconventional mm-hmm. and sort of not the best practice for how, you know, many writers were trained. The brainstorming and discussions around what would be important, you know, from a storytelling standpoint, was initially kind of, again, unconstrained, uninformed from best practice. But as we tried to make progress, the lack of the frame of reference for the right type of framework and pacing and, um, you know, what story elements need to be true and, and sort of what pieces of, the, of an episode really were showing. And so we needed to augment them with expertise. And, you know, but essentially it's like we had to find the right formula in terms of capabilities for yeah. Both the craft and the expertise, but also chemistry with the passion and deep understanding and love of the characters and, and sort of the ideas of what could bring these characters to life. And, you know, again, there was no guarantee that it would work. 
Uh, and I think in many cases it, it wouldn't. But the reason, you know, to quote Ed Catmull, you know, the mm -hmm. president of Pixar, you know, you can give a you know great idea to a mediocre team and they make it mediocre. You can give a mediocre idea to a great team and they make it great. Part of the magic or of what happened was, you know, we just ended up having the right people who are unwilling mm -hmm. to not make something great. And the company that was willing to invest and support and be patient and allow for the iteration, um, you know, again, even though there's a lot more detail to that story. And one of the things that was fascinating, though, is also is the amount of internal resistance, to your point, too, where a lot of a lot of people were going, we're a game company. You know, what the hell are we doing? Like, why do we want to go Hollywood? You know, type thing. And to a certain extent, that's a very valid question. Um, you know, but from the other end, it's everybody sort of got it after Arcane came out and worked and then they saw our players' reaction and love for it uh, because it really helped, of course, elevate the IP in a lot of ways in a way that we couldn't achieve, you know, with the sort of traditional mediums we had on on, on the game side. It's, it's amazing. But it's I mean, a, it was a big leap. It's really, I mean, you know, just before we move, I think one of the things I love about Arcane, I've been watching it last night and I was able to kind of watch it second time and it is so ambitious in so many different dimensions. Uh, for example, right? Uh, there are two. This is not really spoilers. For folks who haven't watched it, uh, uh, and if you're probably like so long, you've probably watched it. Which is, you know, there are two time jumps in one season, right? There are so many different characters to uh, track, and so many different things. There's kind of the rich folks, the poor folks. There is this, uh, you know, hex tech, this advanced piece of uh, technology happening. There is family strife, right? There are so many different things going on. There's obviously, you know, the graphical elements being really pushed. Something just gorgeous. Like there was, we watching a, a fight sequence uh, in episode six, and the way it is shot, the pacing, it's just, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. And I was like, it is so ambitious in what it is trying to do. There are so many elements. And I can totally imagine the easier, simpler version of it. Like, let's take our most popular champion, have them set out. And, you know, I just want to say, just congratulations to you and everyone on the team because the sheer ambition, risk-taking, and just you folks nailed the landing on that one. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I will say, you know, all credit in the world to, you know, Fortiche and to, you know, Christian and Alex and Melinda and, you know, the whole squad. And there's been a lot of people that have poured blood, sweat, and tears into that, both from the arcane perspective as well as from, you know, League of Legends world building perspective. And so, it takes a village and, you know, but what's interesting is Riot is really a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some ways I feel like we take two steps forward, one step back, you know, over and over and over. And, but at every new sort of threshold, you know, we sort of achieve new things, but then we sometimes forget or need to relearn, you know, some of the fundamentals. But the thing that keeps the company strong over time is yeah. that mission. I love know, it. And the sort of the general commitment that everybody has to learning and getting better. And when you are able to be, to go long-term and you have incredibly talented people, who are sort of unwilling to let something not be great, crazy things can happen. So we feel I incredibly also, fortunate. I think the other thing that stood out to me, and I feel like you're kind of underplaying this a little bit, you know, you attribute your team for like success. And I think all that it's true. Part of it, I think for me is you mentioned psychological safety, but in the context of that, I think there's something magical about you and your team and the company being just refusing to take the status quo as it is and kind of like you call it naivety and like through the course of the last hour you've like had different words for the same thing but I think at the end of it it's like you're okay you are almost you don't seek permission to go do rebellious things mostly because there's no pattern to go match against and so that gives you freedom to go operate and you kind of refuse to like Take the norm of like, oh, you know what, like go, okay, we're making a show. What is the way to do it? Conventional wisdom says, go to the people who've done shows before and work with them mm -hmm. and take seek their expertise. And a lot of this very quickly goes down this path of this extreme focus group, best practices thing. And yeah. you kind of give this freedom to you, to, to yourself, to the team to kind of say, eh, ignore that for a second. We think we know what we're doing here. We may be wrong, but we should at least go try this and kind of have this like rebellious spirit and attitude. And I think you kind of underplay that a little bit. And I think there is like something about having um, that very crappy mentality of like being able to do that. You know, I, I do think, uh, you know, one of the values that we, that we talk about, Ryan, is you know, stay hungry, stay humble. Uh, and I think that when you truly have a mission that people really believe in, you know, you can really never achieve that mission. It's yeah. the goalpost always moves. Yeah. And I think it's also a really incredible experience. And I feel incredibly lucky. And I think many people that have had this experience feel this lucky to work with and around 
really talented people who always want to get better mm-hmm. and always want to improve and are sort of never satisfied with anything that they do. And that can be both an incredible blessing, but also an incredible curse, mm-hmm. you know, because there's always something more you can do. You could, we could have done a better job for players. We could have fixed this other thing or, you know, whatever it is. And we see all the words, you know, and so do our creators, mm-hmm. but it's that drive that is genuine to try to do something great that they will love, that they hope other people will love too. Like that sort of ties to that point I referenced at the beginning. It's like when you really share that same dream and people are committed and all in mm-hmm. finding a way, yeah, you know, from top to bottom and not just in the organization, but also shareholders without the sort of capital structure and, you know, successful organization to be able to fund some of these longer term risky death orders, you know, and the patience to get some things wrong, it would never enable the type of innovation for the things that we actually get right. Yeah. Agreed. You know, and because sure. there's a lot of stuff we get wrong. And, you know, sometimes we ship stuff that is not great and then we got to, you know, acknowledge it and, you know, find it back and or fix it. Other times we can't get something that's not coming together and we just cancel it or, you know, it never sees the light of day. You know, but the, I think it's really important that we therefore don't stop swinging the bat. Mm. You know, we think it's incredibly important to have the courage to be bad at the right thing. So then you can become good at the right thing over time as you're mm-hmm. learning, iterating, and improving. That's um, great. I want to look to the future a little bit. You know, looking out next five to seven years, what are trends in gaming or competition or just the internet which get you really excited that you think you and maybe the people watching this will be paying a lot of attention to? I haven't been so excited um, because of a technical trend in a long time as, it, as I am for AI. Like the fact that chat GPT and mid journey and stable diffusion exists and are doing what they're doing. Like, I, you know, I had the luxury of meeting Sam Altman a couple of times and, and talking to him about some things. And, but I thought that the time horizon that he was talking about is way farther away than it actually turns out to be. And it's to me, the potential of AI is just blowing my mind. And I am, and there's many people at the company that are just incredibly excited to dream and think about the types of, gameplay experiences or other applications that could leverage where this revolutionary technology is. Uh, give me an going. example, right? Like something very specific. Five years from now, GPT-5, right? Or something of that like, what can I, you know, log in, play? What will I see? I do dream of a virtual world where, you know, this, let's just call it where I could walk into the last drop, you know, the bar, you know, and so on, you know, we're by and everybody from and have a full-on conversation with the barkeep mm-hmm. and it's totally ai driven yeah. and you know synthesized chat you know text to voice with emotion in the culture and sort of in, you know infused with the history of that particular region i mean there's so many possibilities yeah. that are going to be opening up over time that are going to be very difficult to pull off but again that if we can get right we'll be incredibly compelling so i've been i've been playing over the holidays a lot of elden ring or they can be a testament to a <laughs> lot of elden ring and yeah. you know or any of these games and you can you know you kind of poke one of the npc characters a few times and they run out of dialogue and that's that and you know chat gpt kind of became a thing over the same time horizon i was like well chat gpt can totally replace this right like and you can just <laughs> chat with the barkeep or the knight and they can have a conversation with you and it's not like the five six lines that are scripted and then they run out of lines yeah well so i think the, the question is is how do you have a situation where that doesn't happen? You know, and I think that, I mean, as time goes on to infinity, that'll absolutely be the case. You know, I mean, you know, for those that have read Ender's Game, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the infinitely evolving yeah. sort of tied into his brain, you know, game that sort of adjusts dynamically to, you know, deliver incredible experiences that will likely exist at some point. Um, and so, you know, how that manifests or what platform it's on, who knows, it's, it's probably decades away. You know, but it's fun to think about AI, the scope increases that can exist also from improved workflows and capabilities. You know, there are a lot of engineers are thrilled, you know, that you know, there's things like Copilot that can help them mm-hmm. write code, you know, mm-hmm. more efficiently and effectively and reduce mistakes. Um, you know, a lot of artists, of course, are appropriately, you know, threatened and feeling scared and, you know, and you know, for you know, a lot of the AI generation uh, or generative capabilities. But I I think that a lot are also really embracing or realizing that there can be a, you know, sort of an unlocking of a lot of creative potential as well. And sort of some, you know, some new skills can be developed on that, but there's just a lot of 
the ability to do more for players. And, um, and so, you know, I think we're going to need to figure it out as an organization. We're going to need to figure out as, you know, artists and engineers and designers and producers and, you know, as an industry. Um, but I think it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it'll take a while for these things to really manifest in significantly meaningful ways for games, you know, but I think in the next, you know, five and definitely, you know, seven to 10 years, there will be a, a you know, a, a generational mm -hmm. leap that is going to be significant. You return to, you know, Riot, right? And I think it's also interesting in terms of timelines because League uh, is now over a decade old. Um, and there was a, you know, his, if you're going to go back to history of games, games are going to consider these, you know, hit driven mechanics, right? You play for a little bit of time and they go on, uh, but league, and there'll never be a league too. It'll be league, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be 10 years, uh, 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 already. Uh, I'm curious, A, why did you come back? Uh, what motivated you? And B, what is league at 20 years, you know, in, in the league of 2030, uh, going to look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and we're talking about that a lot, uh, internally, and we, we've got some cool stuff that we're going to start to tease the players actually that over the next couple of months um, around sort of what a, a sort of a big next inflection point could be. But, you know, the, the, the why I, I sort of came back is one, I never fully left. You know, when, when Brandon and I stepped down as co-CEOs, you know, we both became co-chairmen, you know, we were exhausted, you know, from sort of burning at both ends for you know 13 years straight, kept getting involved operationally first with some projects, um, you know, and then on the entertainment side to, you know, help make sure we can get our cane out the door and, and sort of do it justice. Uh, and then I'm back over on the game side now. Um, but the the sort of catalyst for all those engagements is essentially I wasn't willing to have certain things that I cared a lot about not happen. Uh, and there were some some big things that were sort of at risk that I cared a lot about, uh, such as launching or announcing a lot of our games that we worked on for a long period of time and sort of getting those right. Um, you know, arcane, you know, and then there's some stuff on the game side. And, you know, I think that we're really trying to institutionalize what makes Riot special. And which means that, of course, succession planning and developing leaders is incredibly important. And, you know, we've got a great executive team and, and CEO and, and Niccolo, who, you know, built International for us and ran for a long time. We've got a, an amazing team. But there are certain perspectives and or capabilities that are really important to the creation of great things that sometimes are at risk, you know, and at risk just because of the nature of how much is going on and, you know, all the incredible capabilities we have now, it's been sort of exciting and gratifying and challenging. And I was sort of afraid for it for a while, you know, but to sort of be asked to, to dive back in and, and help uh, in different ways. And so, uh, and then I, you know, was excited to find out again, like I've, really love being mm -hmm. back in the trenches. I love it. So yeah, it's a labor of love. And, you know, I've, I've also, but it's also, I think I have a healthier engagement with the company now than I did for sort of the first 12 or 13 years mm -hmm. where I'm sort of re-engaging a little more mature, a little more balanced, you know, in life, a little more effective in managing my time, a little more certainly, you know, strategic mm -hmm. high level and, uh, you know, trusting a lot of our great leaders and people, mm -hmm. you know, in, in ways that, you know, sometimes had to grab the wheel a little bit more or did grab the wheel a little bit more earlier on. And, and so, you know, just trying to find the right balance, but uh, I'm not willing to let it go yet. What are some non-Riot made games that has impressed you or you've been playing a bunch in recent times? Yeah, well, so Dark and Darker uh, is a, a pretty cool, fun game that's, uh, you know, sort of getting some buzz right now. It's from a small Korean studio mm -hmm. that's uh, sort of like a fun RPG team-based extraction game, sort of like a PUBG Tarkov. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's just there's one of the cool things about the game business is it's constantly being disrupted, you know, or there's new platforms or business models or new cool gameplay innovations uh, or new technology. So it's just a really dynamic industry. And so there's just always opportunity. Um, but that's one that I, that I think is pretty cool. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm a big fan of you know, Warhammer 40K. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, the a movie, game, there's a movie coming out with uh, Henry Cavill who is probably a, <laughs> one of the hugest fans of Warhammer 40K in sort of the celebrity world. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I know the people at Games Workshop that helped put that deal together and whatnot, and I'm so thrilled uh, as a fan, you know, and I'm so excited, you know, for, for Henry and, and mm -hmm. for Amazon. And, you know, it's just, it's cool that I also think that, especially with like The Last of Us doing well and all this, like the approach that Hollywood is also taking now with games, I think is very different than it was 
you know, seven to 10 years ago, uh, where I think there's much more desire to really try to invest in, in these properties and make them great as well, uh, which I think really bodes well for the future. And so um, that's that's something that's really exciting. You know, WOW just had a great new expansion, you know, with mm-hmm. Dragonflight, which brought in a lot of hype again. You know, we got a lot of friends at Blizzard, always want them to win and are big fans. Mm-hmm. Um, do you get a chance you know, to play uh, Elden Ring at all, which has kind of been, you know, if you look at 2022, it's always kind of comes up like one of the top games. Elden Ring, uh, uh, do you get a chance to play it at all? No, I, have, I bought it, but I haven't I haven't played it. And so a lot of rioters have told me all about it. I, of course, watch people stream it, mm-hmm. um, you know, but I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet. But uh, that game looks right up my alley. And with one of the cool things that I think Elden Ring, a lot of the open world games are helping to demonstrate also is the question of what is an MMO, you know, is mm-hmm. also continuing mm-hmm. to sort of evolve. Um, you know, because there's so many games that are sort of demonstrating different aspects of multiplayer, but, you know, or, or large numbers of players online, but not necessarily in the way of a traditional sort of oh, yeah. mud style game, like a EverQuest or a WoW. Yeah. Uh, and that's just, that's also really, really cool. So. The one thing I love about Elden Ring, and I'm not a game creator at all by any, cha- any chance, is that it is so unapologetic, I think, which is like, yeah. it just, it's hard. There are no signs, totally. right? And it's brutal, right? And there is no difficulty level. It's just hard. And, you know, you have to figure this out. And, you know, I can totally imagine maybe a more Western style mechanic to be like, well, we got to make it easier and blah, blah, blah. And no, they just totally went for it. And I think there is something pure about that. Hey, this is like learning to play the violin or it's going to be hard. And But that is yeah. part of the appeal, which, which you know, which is really, you know, once you get into it, it's really resonated with me. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think we had a lot of the same philosophy on League. And, you know, and I think that to your point, that's a good example of why games are hard. You know, it's the best games have a perspective, mm. you know, and I think they're just, you know, not, again, trying to sort of chase some commercial trend, you know, but recognize something that a, a visionary or a creator thinks would be incredible and can rally a whole team of amazing creators to go realize. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think Elden Ring, of course, you know, deserves all the, all the great accolades that, that, that they've gotten yeah. uh, for doing exactly that. That's awesome. Um, I see Shriram every night pointing at the screen, cursing, yelling. Uh, this is him trying to play Elden yeah, Ring and make some lot. progress every day. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, I think... I touched on the, you know, the similarities with founders and, you know, starting companies, that kind of thing. Uh, A lot of our show listeners are either founders um, or people who want to be founders. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's a fairly, you know, we we have audiences from basically across the world. uh, And so different markets, different countries. And so I guess... um, Knowing what you know, you're like very deep into the founder entrepreneurial journey. Uh, You've learned a lot through this process and you're doing, you're trying to like constantly push the boundaries here. What advice do you have for founders or people who want to be founders? The number one thing to me that would be important for a founder is start a, like fall in love with a problem, you know, essentially, or like in, and or an opportunity rather than sort of like thinking something is going to be a great way to make a buck. Like mm-hmm. I, I think that the, the great entrepreneurs are really driven and motivated by trying to improve something that they feel very dissatisfied by and or could see intimately and feel how that thing could be better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that, if that orientation will, in my experience, tends to lead to that relentless problem solving and resourcefulness to figure out how to you know, leverage all the critical thinking capabilities, whatever, to solve that, to solve whatever problem. And I think that orientation also helps inspire other great people who also want to solve that problem in some unique way to come join you on the journey. Uh, and when that's authentic and real and you're committed there's a lot of gravitational pull that can be created that can help attract capital, to, you know, human and financial to go make that a reality. I, I love it. I think that's probably not a better note I can think of. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, this okay. was such a blast. Yeah, well, I'm going to have one last final fun thing. The, who in your mind is the most underappreciated champion in league? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, this is not Mark Merrill. This is Trimer uh, answering. <laughs> you know, we can change the <laughs> captions yes. or something. I would say, you know, what's what's so interesting is, you know, I know the data, and so I know, you know, a lot of people are fans 
of, you know, like somebody loves all of our characters. You know, every character isn't for everybody, but somebody loves the character. So, you know, but uh, but one character, or one champion that is, is sort of straddles that line between a champion you love or you hate, and it's just binary. There's no like intermediate. You know, is Timo, mm-hmm. um, and so you know, I think I think Timo adds a lot of dimensionality to League because it was the, you know was one of the early Yordles that we created, and uh, you know really helped define the sort of Scouts code, which ended up being part of the sort of cultural experience around being in Bandle City. And it's just super annoying to play against, but also really fun to play at. And so uh, team of <laughs> agreed. Great, awesome. great I love it. I, I think this is going to go viral, that last 30 seconds right there, right? <laughs> like, you know, Riot founder says, uh, but, you know, Mark, uh, I just want to say, you know, I, I've gotten to know you a little bit, you know, Alan, and, you know, I always love our conversations and it's just your journey, right? Not just, you know, just really reinventing the category of esports, but then, uh, you know, moving into different worlds with content and entertainment. I'm so excited to see Arcane season two and everything that uh, uh, comes out of that. Uh, it's such I, a pleasure. I, this was know, amazing. I think we love the breadth of ambition that you have and the drive to just go create and and then to follow through that with like incredible execution. It's just such a delight to just watch you and Riot at work and pull this all together um, and just see the whole journey. So this is such an inspiration for us. It's kind of a bucket list interview. Thanks so much for just making the time and making this happen. Well, thank you to you both. It's been really fun being here and, uh, you know, loved it. So really appreciate you taking the time. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Mark. Bye, guys.